Yeah. Section attention. So section four and five. Okay, thanks. Good to see everyone. All right, three o'clock on Friday afternoon. It's gorgeous outside. We get to do math. Sweet, huh? Yeah. I've noticed a number of you have enrolled in STAT Lab, but I've also noticed not all of you have enrolled in STAT Lab. So if there's some issues, let me know. But you need to please get it done. And what I've discovered is if perchance uh, you're waiting for a book or even money, I, it seems like you can get a temporary, a 17-day account. So there's absolutely no reason not to be on there, even if you're waiting for a book to arrive. Okay. So Monday, then, I should see the full complement of everyone enrolled in the course. All right? Now, uh, I don't re require uh, you to sit in the same place, but I, I just know it's human nature that we tend to do that. And by the second class, I've observed people have pretty much staked out their row in their class or their seat. So, I have 93 students this semester. This helps my mature mind learn your names faster. Uh, any other questions before we begin today? Uh, you've looked at Angel, hopefully. Found materials there. Okay. Stat Lab, a few of you still need to get going. Right. And I know some of you are waiting for books. Any other the mechanics of this trivia we need to go over? No? All right, well, let's do some math. I can't remember if I brought this up once or not, one of my favorite quotes. You know, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. A lot of the material that is here in chapter one, you might get the impression, well, this isn't math, it's more like psychology. We're going to be going over a lot of terms and concepts. But I hope to convince you today that this is, this is really important stuff. We don't go over this just so the professors can make multiple choice questions. No, it is convenient for that. It's important because, well, because of this concept. Statistics can be kinds of lies. And we want to give you skills for critical thinking. I'll expand on this some more here. You're inundated with statistics all the time, aren't you? And I hope you're going to be more finely tuned to it. Uh, just uh, today I've heard, um, uh, what's the big debate now, oh, whether to have, uh, to uh, use military force in Syria. People are taking polls. Right? They need a statistic, they need numbers to, to quantify it. You hear all sorts of claims being justified or attempt to verify them using statistics, the numbers. It tends to give it more weight, doesn't it? If I can say, ah, four out of five dentists recommend dentine. But what I hope to accomplish in the next week or two is to give you some of the tools so that when you're running across these claims, these statistics, you can be educated consumers of statistical information. That's my goal. Another way I like to say is I want you to be informed skeptics and underline informed, all right? That's important. Because after all, we know that's true, right? The author has this large framework for the first chapter. I think it's useful to go through it. Uh, by the way, I've taken his PowerPoints and I integrate material from my notes. So the Word documents up in uh, HOD are kind of optional as I go through what I feel is useful. I insert into the PowerPoint slides. And today we're really be we're going to focus on this first step: prepare. To analyze and conclude will come later. Particularly in 106, we spent a lot of time about analysis and concluding. And it all starts with what does it mean and 
what do I what question do I want to answer? Here's a formula for a statistic. Uh, anybody recognize that? Exactly. Well, you're going to know it in about two or three weeks. It's the mathematical symbol for calculating a mu or a mean, a population mean, which is the word we use for an average. Okay. Now, mathematicians like symbols like that. We get excited about it. It's a very concise, precise way of explaining a calculation. The x sub i would be numbers. For example, if I wanted to calculate the mean weight of the cadets in this room, each x sub i would be your weight. And I'd use this formula to calculate it. There was a time in statistics where this part of the work was the heavy lifting, an important part. Nowadays, it's not. Doing this calculation, and if I wanted to impress you with formulas, there's a lot more complicated <coughs> ones that actually you'll be using in your calculators, much more involved. We can look at those, but you know what? I probably shouldn't say this as a math instructor, but they're really not as important as the x sub i's, what goes into the formula. I can put weights of cadets in here and get a reasonable number that means something to come out the end, but I could put junk in there for my x sub i's, jam it into my ti calculator, and it'll be happy to calculate regression coefficients, chi-squared statistics, and all kinds of complicated things. But they won't mean anything if these things don't have meaning. Right? It's what goes into the process, which is really key to what we're going to emphasize today. We want to be checking to see is the source objective, is it biased. Uh, we want to look for studies from sources that might have a, 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 an iron in the fire. And we'll go through lots of examples of this. In particular, a lot of today is about, I started to draw this up, the big picture that I went over on Wednesday. view of statistics from 30,000 feet. We have a population that we wish to know something about. We want to study some of its characteristics. The characteristics of the population we call parameters. Well, how do we study? The populations are often too big, too dispersed, too diverse to actually study all at once, so we take a sample using some kind of a sampling method. We get a number that we, a sample size we can work with, and we compute statistics that we hope tell us something about these parameters. And if you want a one slide overview of what statistics is, that's it. A few more details to come up. Now, what we're going to focus on in chapter one here is really this part over here the sampling methods, the population parameters before we get to the formulas and crunching the numbers. Because if you don't have good thought, and good planning, good preparation here, this is meaningless anyways. Forget about it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I, under, I underlined these words from the author. With technology, good analysis is easy. Now, I, I have to sh share this one story for you my past. I took a lot of statistics courses and anyone get that you want to guess what I use for a calculator? A slide rule. How many of you ever seen a slide rule? There's one in the lobby as you come in the left. A very, very large one. We didn't have that. I was very proud of mine. My red coat bamboo 16 inch special slide rule. That's how I got through graduate school doing statistics. And the calculations were a lot of work. <coughs> Nowadays, the calculations are free. Right? You don't have to worry about using slide rules and scientific notation and all the shortcuts to get values. And that's a good thing. 
because we're going to focus on common sense and the sound statistical methods before we even get to those numbers. Okay, an important concept is that of statistical significance. And if you have a highlighter or you can take notes or underline, this is probably a good place to start. <coughs> this is a term that we'll introduce today. We're going to refine it in about two weeks, and then all through 106 you'll be using it again and again and again. Each time we're going to be more and more precise about it. So today I'm going to wave my hands a little bit, but we'll introduce the concept to you. We say a result is statistically significant based on some hypothesis, if the outcome I get is very unlikely. What does that mean? Here's an example. Let's suppose I wanted to determine if a coin was fair or not. There's a 50-50 chance of getting a heads or a tail. So that's my hypothesis that the coin is fair. I toss it 100 times. That's my sampling method, and it costs it 100 times. So what am I measuring? Well, my statistic I'm measuring is the number of hits. And the parameter I'm interested in back in my population is the true percentage of hits that I get from this coin. Hopefully that would be, ideally, it's 50%. If I got 52 heads out of 100, that's not an unusual result. My feeling is, we're being a little bit imprecise now, but in not too distant future, we'll calculate, calculate this probability exactly. The probability of 52 heads out of 100. But that data suggests the coin's actually fair. It's not unusual. All right, let me be vague about unusual for the time being. But what if you got 82 heads? What would you conclude then? Would you expect to get 82 heads out of 100? No. I mean, right now it's a gut feel, but you'll see when the study probability, that's a really, really small chance. It's unusual. And an outcome is unusual based on an assumption. It's statistically significant. It's aha. I've got a result that contradicts my assumption. Statistical significance. You've probably heard that phrase a lot. That uh, we did this study in medicine or whatever, and the results were statistically significant. Basically, that's what it means. More details to come. Just because the result is statistically significant, significant, it doesn't mean it has practical significance. And the author makes this distinction. Let's take an example here. You see a lot of statistics, a lot of claims about different diet programs, right? Buy our little canned package deals, you won't be hungry, you can eat anything you want, and you lose 20 pounds a month. Well, you can test that. And actually, in 106, we'll study how to conduct tests to see if those claims are true. <coughs> and the claim might be statistically significant. The outcome is unusual, based on an assumption. But what if the outcome is you're going to lose 4.6 pounds in a year? Is that practical significance? Well, you know, if I weigh 400 pounds, my doctor says, you know, I'm going to have a heart attack unless you lose 200 pounds, am I going to go for a diet that gives me 4.6 pounds? <coughs> no. It's not practical. It doesn't have practical significance. In the next uh, section, we're going to go through a list of pitfalls. These are all the bad things that can happen and all the things you should avoid. We're back here and we're preparing and getting ready to do our study. And one of the most common violations or abuses of statistics is this idea of correlation. You've heard that word used a lot, haven't you? These two things are correlated. Well, when you hear that, Please, please keep in mind that correlation does not imply causality. Correlation, which you'll study in 106, is a mathematical definition come up with a single number that measures the correlation. But it just tells you these two things tend to happen together. It does not tell you that one causes the 
the other. It's a totally separate uh, situation. I'll give an example, and I'll have to give credit to actually Khan Academy in this. He was uh, commenting on a study that was done. And this study found a correlation between eating breakfast and uh, I think it was uh, either low, uh, I think it was BMI, body mass index, or a low or a, a healthy. In other words, you weren't fat. There's a correlation, a statistically significant correlation. These two things tended to happen together. As you, those people who ate for breakfast on a regular basis tended to have lower BMI, tended to be less obese. So what should we do? Should we all just have eggs, bacon, toast with butter, flapjacks for breakfast? What could be going on here? Yes? Different uh, lifestyles. Because, uh, I mean, normally when you have people that are getting up and eating breakfast, they've been up for a while, they've been active, where people sometimes don't eat breakfast, uh, aren't active until later on, so they're a little bit lazier, a little bit less active throughout the day. That's one of the key conclusions he came to, too. I think it makes a lot of sense. Why would you tend to eat more breakfast? Well, if you're hungry. Why would you be hungry? Well, if you exercise a lot. I would imagine all the athletes in BMI that have their workouts from 4 o'clock maybe to 8 or 10 at night, they eat a big breakfast. And they probably tend to have a healthier weight or lower BMI. So, is it possible that the real cause effect here is exercise and the secondary effect is eating breakfast and it's not that eating a breakfast causes you to lose weight it's something else or, or most likely in the real world there's lots of things that influence your BMI the statistical fact is true there's a correlation between these two you just can't interpret that one causes the other that's the danger All right, another pitfall, self-interest study. Uh, I'll give you, a, I'll make up an example of the current topic. I like to start my morning with a cup of coffee and I go up to New York Times or uh, one of the newspapers and I look for what's happening. And suppose I saw a study that said 80% of college instructors are in favor of having a handgun with them in class. 80%. Then I looked a little bit further, and the study was conducted by the NRA. And they did it by asking people at their website to fill out the survey. If I changed your opinion at all. Come on, you're awful quiet today. What's going on here? What, I mean, this is an obvious no-brainer. What's going on here? Yes. The audience that the NRA put the survey to. Yeah, my I, I raised it. My sampling method. My sample is obviously pretty biased, pretty different, right? And if they if they did the sample and they didn't get the result they wanted, do you suppose they would then advertise it? No. So that's knowing. This is coming back to that informed skeptic, all right? Underlying informed. When you're presented with statistical or quantitative information, you're not going to be worrying about the formulas they use to do the calculations. Right? You should be worrying about this course of the class. Who did it? How did they take the sample? How many people were in the sample? Is it a random sample? We're going to talk about all of those in here. Is it a sufficiently large sample? Obviously, the size of the sample makes a lot of difference. And as a general rule of thumb, the bigger the sample size I have, the more people I take in my sample, the 
the more robust my statistics will be. Here's another one that is just amazing. And you see this all the time out there in the, um, in the real world, <laughs> particularly in the, in the political dialogue when different positions are being provided <coughs> by different people. And you'd say, well, how can they get a different result? Well, an awful lot depends on how you answer, ask the question. In this case, it's a, a survey. Let's think about it. We want to study whether people believe the uh, president should have a line item veto. So in this case, what's our population? And then Dylan, what do you think our population would be in that case, if I'm studying this? Yeah, all, probably all adults, something like that. Yeah, all right, so I'm not going to ask all 300 million on the same day. I'm going to do a sample. So that's the population. What am I measuring? My parameter? Well, it's a percentage. How many of this population believe the president should have the line item view? That's my parameter. I'd like to know that number. How am I going to know it? Well, I'm going to take a sample and ask a question. Well, certainly my sample size would change the outcome. Who I sample would change the outcome. But what you might not realize is just how I ask the question can radically change the outcome. Look at the difference here. 97% said yes, the president should have the line item veto to eliminate waste. But only 57% said the president should have the line item veto. What's going on here? What's different in those sentences? In the background. Go ahead. Get it. Is it Faust? It's not the size. Right, your Faust. Yes, sir. The size? I just said one is more specific. Hmm? One is more specific. Yeah, it's one more specific. Specific, and who doesn't want to eliminate waste? Right? Yeah, okay, eliminate waste. Well, by the way, the white item veto could also eliminate that military base in your county. Or maybe that new highway is not going to get constructed now. Or maybe we're not going to have a uh, the federal subsidy of uh, growing corn or whatever. Oh, that line item veto. When you're presented with these, look at the question they ask. And it's not only the question. This study is really amazing. A true study. If you just change the order of the words in the question, you don't put any uh, prejudicial words in, but just change the order, you'll get a different result. In this survey, it was we wanted people to say if they thought that traffic or industry contributed more to pollution. Traffic or industry. When we worded the question this way and put traffic first, 45% of the majority said, oh, it's traffic. That causes more pollution. Now when you ask the same question but just reverse the order, would you say industry or traffic contributes more to pollution? They said, oh, it's industry. In other words, human nature, things being relatively equal, they just took the first option. So if you're a clever pollster, and there are a lot of clever, clever pollsters, what are they going to do when they formulate the question? I put the answer I want first out of the list of options. Another example of a loaded question. Too little money is being spent on welfare. Too little money is being spent on assistance to the poor. Welfare has become a pejorative term. But to help the poor? Yeah, let's help the poor. But I don't want to. I don't want to in welfare. Words are incredibly loaded with connotation, positive or negative, and it's going to impact your results. And no amount of fancy statistics or computers or calculators are going to overcome that. Another potential pitfall. No response. 
time. Usually when I get a phone call at 7 o'clock at night, I look to see the phone number. And if it's an unknown area code or sometimes I'll even say survey, then I, I usually hang up. But if I'm in the mood and I actually answer the questions or re re pick up the phone, there comes a time when I'm just tired of it. And I'll say, I, I don't know. No response. Well, if you ask a question a survey, 30% of the people decline to answer. How do you interpret that? Is that not important? Or is that important to the meaning of your study? The fact that 30% of the people didn't even want to be bothered to answer your question. It's a huge issue. What do I know about these people? Uh, let's take another example of this. In the August break, the Congress men and women were busy going out to their districts and meeting me, having town hall meetings. Who do you suppose comes to those meetings? And who do you think tends to not come to no responses? What do people come to those meetings? Yes. People that are interested in the town's affairs? Yes, but more than interested. People making money from their students? Okay, that, then I'm interested. It's the people that have the strongest feelings, right? One way or the other on the issue. Yeah, you've read about the people that are organizing to try to persuade the hot issue now is immigration. So what do you think those town hall meetings are going to be like? going to have people on one side being really loud and people on the other side being really loud. No responders, no people in the middle. They might have an opinion, but they don't have that fervent opinion, which is you have to understand what kind of responses you're getting. I'm pretty sure most <coughs> congressmen or women understand what kind of responses they're getting at their town hall meetings. Um, missing data. We do a census every 10 years. We try to count everybody in the United States and get demographic information about them. You think we get everyone? We hire 200,000 people temporarily. Huge effort. Huge effort. All right, we don't get everyone. Is that a problem? What do you think? Rakowski? Yeah. Why? Um, because there was part of the demographics also. Some people might miss a large majority of the demographic. Yeah, what, what kind of people would we probably not get in the census? What people are not counted? What kind of people? Yes. Awesome. Uh, the people that don't make as much money, um, like uh, the people who are unemployed, it's like 70 something right now. Um, those people aren't counting, the people that aren't making, yeah, the majority of aren't making any census. Yeah, the, uh, the chances are, it's easy to find someone in a, uh, a nice suburb of Northern Virginia where there's 3,000 square foot houses, you know, you just walk down the street knocking one after the other. I don't know if any of you are from Rockbridge County or counties like this, but you go back in some of our windy roads back in the haulers, and it's hard to find people. I'm serious about that. And there are people. They're hard to count. If someone's living in a car cardboard box under a bridge, they're hard to count. So we know that we're not counting everyone. And if you're to make informed decisions, you have to understand how many and what kinds of people you're not counting. There's a lot of politics involved with that too, unfortunately. Missing data, missing people. And another pitfall is we have this perception that if it's a number, it's accurate, right? Numbers are precise. Well, it's like I, that first slide when I said 79.865% of statistics is a lie. It's very easy come up with a statistic that has, that, that would lead you to believe more precision than is actually there. So you, you have
have to be careful. We have this intuitive feeling that, oh, it's a number. It's got to be correct, precise. But in statistics, it's really, well, it's a statistic. It's an estimate of something instead of the real thing. 